How's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Alvin. I'm co-president of the American Marketing Association. Just to get a quick start, I just want to tell you guys that tomorrow we are holding a community service event with OU uh, in the Gold Rooms. From and you can come if you want to fulfill the membership requirement for community service. Uh, you can come by any time from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Just spend some of your time there, and you can fulfill your that aspect of your membership. Also, want to add if you have a membership pack and if you want to become an AMA member, you can do so easily. Just check the program. You can see how to become a member and just turn your membership packets uh, as soon as you can. We also have the list of the upcoming events on there, and you can easily contact contact us via email or through that website uh, if you have any questions or anything like that. Uh, that's all I have to say, and I just want to introduce Tony Sakic, uh, marketing director for Augur. He's also an alum of OU. Uh, we want to really thank him for, so much for coming, so give him a round of applause. Thanks, everyone. So I just I want everyone to know first and foremost that this was a speech I prepared to present at the DevCon conference in the UK last week. I uh, did not go to that, and I decided to do it here because they're nice enough to film it for me so everyone in the Ethereum community can know that and see what I'm presenting because marketing is something that's uh, it's something that a lot of these projects find challenging and from, from what I see, so there, there's a lot of people that were interested in seeing the speech. Uh, one of the, I just actually got to meet someone who teaches an entrepreneurship marketing course uh, here at OU, and I, I was just explaining to him that I decided not to go on the trip, and that was because part, uh, Augur is something that I'm deeply involved with, and I'm very, I'm very financially conservative, and one of the things that I believe in most is I don't want to say this in a bad way, but being cheap with marketing. Marketing is not spending money. And, and if, if that is the attitude, that's the wrong attitude. The best marketing is free. Uh, now, that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't ever spend money. That just means that there are different cases and you really need to know when it's appropriate and when it's not. There are so many, especially in software, cases where companies lose big because they blew a ton of money on marketing. I've learned from experience and companies that I was with in the past how bad of an idea that can be. So I guess that was the first thing I wanted to mention even before I get into everything. So uh, let me start this off, and I'm going to give you a uh, presentation that the slides aren't as relevant as what I say, obviously, but I'm also going to answer any questions at the end, and I really want, that's where usually the best parts of these come out, so feel free to ask anything at that point. So I began here in Detroit uh, working for Eminem's record label. It was his indie label, so it wasn't Interscope, it was Web Entertainment. And it was actually because of the hookup of this guy in the front row, Kelly Frazier, also known as DJ K Fresh, who I didn't expect to be here. He hooked me up with that, and I worked for a couple artists named The Romantics and King Gordy. Uh, the music industry at the time was going through a switch, and it was, it was really being changed and impacted by peer-to-peer, -peer, like Napster, and essentially BitTorrent was, I think, right around there was when it launched. Uh, the attitudes were very uh, out of date, I would say, and just really out of touch. I remember one of the things for one of the artists was King Gordy, and uh, I remember the suggestion I made, and I distinctively remember this, was to give the album away for free because it wasn't selling anymore. You, the, the looks I got from these old school music music guys were just shocking. You know, These guys worked with George Clinton and P-Funk, and that, that's the top artist that's coming to my mind, but a lot of other local artists that were pretty successful. They didn't get it, and my, my explanation was if 100 people download it and one person buys it, that's one more sale than we had before. Uh, Instead, I was asked to, uh, to distribute fake MP3s of the, of the songs on Napster with noise and buzz on it, something that I actually thought was very bad. Uh, as, at the point I was 19, I did what I was told. Since then, I've learned I, I did the wrong thing. I should have fought more for my beliefs. I, I, really, I really did the wrong thing. The music industry really didn't learn their lesson for a few more years until iTunes came out uh, and really changed everything. And to this day, they're kind of behind. Uh, this is an essential part of the story because what I learned there is what ended up getting me here. Uh, and by that I mean with Augur and with my interest in this kind of technology. I graduated here at OU, and uh, one of my favorite and best teachers I had is actually in the back. He's a marketing professor here at Oakland University by the name of Larry Schramm. And he gave awesome, awesome lectures that were really full of real world experience something that I learned a lot from, and because it was stuff that you didn't always get from all the professors that taught out of the book. Real world examples are huge, and I would encourage anyone to, first and foremost, I would encourage everyone to take one of his courses if you can, because if, at the very least, you will leave with a different perspective than you're getting from your other marketing teachers, provided they're similar from when I was going through the program about six or seven years ago. Um, and, and that's really essential. Different points of view are so important, and 
It's not politics. It, it has nothing to do with political points of view, but it has to do with getting as much information as you can, filtering it, see what works for you and works for whatever project you had, regardless if it's marketing, finance, or just starting your own business. There, there's so many different ways that getting different perspectives helps you. Getting information is how things change in the world. And information distribution is essential too, all the way back to the printing press. So I can't emphasize enough how important that was that I had him as a teacher here. And I suggest so, so very much that, that you, you, you take his course and also you get as many perspectives as you can. There, there really isn't a right answer to a lot of questions. And that means you kind of need to figure out what answer is right for you. Uh, I really emphasize that a lot. And I, I'm glad that he was able to make it out today because it, it's really cool to be able to say this in front of everyone and to encourage everyone to take his courses because of how much they taught me. Uh, from there, I, I, I graduated in 2009 and I discovered Bitcoin in 2012. Um, in 2012, the perception of Bitcoin was somehow way worse than it was now. There it was the reaction was misinformation to, you know, not knowing really anything about what it's what it is other than you can buy drugs with it, uh, which is a truth statement. At the time, that's really what it was used for. Thankfully, uh, legitimacy has came, has really arrived in the marketplace, and now you have giant banks, Microsoft, Fortune 500 companies interested in this technology. Uh, I'm personally, my viewpoint is that it's never going to be a currency that you use to buy things at a 7-Eleven. It's not practical. There are too many te technological uh, issues for that to ever happen. But the technology is so important that was behind that, that's where things are going to really change. And, and there's going to be a lot of good things happening from that. From remittances to how much it takes to transfer money. It's really ridiculous the price that, that, that you have to pay if you wanted to send money overseas. Uh, all the way to smart contracts, which is something that I'm now very involved with and very interested in. And um, in the moment, I'm actually going to talk a bit about that as well. In 2014, a, a startup named BitPay hired me. Uh, they saw me on LinkedIn, they, and I was working at Oklahoma Community College at the time. They saw me on LinkedIn, they saw that I had Bitcoin knowledge and experience, even though I had never worked in the tech field before. Uh, they contacted me. I really obviously wanted the position because I was passionate about the technology. So I really went all out and you know, made two 20-page presentations of what I would do, what I would bring to the table, and they hired me. They, they moved me to Atlanta, and that is why I'm in Atlanta this day, although I'm no longer with BitPay. Um, since then, they've had some issues, and uh, I'm more than happy to go into those issues. Because when I, I don't want to speak negative to them, because not only do they give me the opportunity, they really are a great company. But there were mistakes that were made, and really, that's where you learn. And there, there, that whole attitude of you learn from your failures is so true. And it's cliche, but what, but it is true. And I'm someone who always feels like if I don't if I don't execute things perfectly, I fail. Uh, and for better or for worse, that's brought me success and downfalls. But I, I can't emphasize enough how much it has taught me things that help Augur be successful. So th there's very interesting things that you can learn just from failure alone. So when it comes to failures, the Bitcoin bowl, the Bitcoin bowl was something that as a, as a sponsorship that BitPay did was, I feel, a terrible mistake. Um, that's just me speaking honestly. There were a few awesome things that kind of came out of it. My role at BitPay was the digital marketing manager. Um, from the beginning, I, I, I was very inquisitive about, was this the right sponsorship for a company in Bitcoin, college football? So something that appeals to tech nerds that are gamers or are heavy into politics. Do they really like college football? Is that right? I, I didn't really buy it at the time, and now I'm sure I don't buy it. Um, we, what happened, though, is we, you know, when, when you're handed that and there, there's something like that happening, what you need to do is get as much value out of it as you can if you're not the one making that decision. So that's what we did. And the Bitcoin Bowl campaign was one of the first successes I had in the field. Um, and, and really what we did was we worked with ESPN as they were the ones showing the bowl game. And throughout the year, we had many partners and large corporate partners to individuals that maybe set up Bitcoin on their web store. And a few that are listed are ESPN, who obviously showed the game, uh, Newegg, a very, actually the second largest web retailer in the world, only behind Amazon, uh, which I, actually I should change it, because I think eBay's ahead of them, but I always hear them listed as number one or number two, but I don't buy it, so I'm going to declare shenanigans on that. Uh, <laughs> and um, Change Tip, who enable you to send Bitcoin and now cash uh, through, through Twitter. So I can say, I, I dig what you're doing, here's five dollars. And you don't need a bank, you don't need any other things like that other than to send money. So essentially, we had the first social media campaign that gave people free money. Uh, it was a pretty interesting idea. ESPN didn't know what to make of it. They really didn't know what to make of it. They did help as much as they could, but they didn't really understand the technology. So 
what, you know, you're giving lemons, let's make some lemonade. So we, we made an announcement. What happened was three hours before the game, we made an announcement from a partnership at Warner Brothers Records. Warner Brothers Records. We had talked with them about uh, actually the band The Black Keys accepting Bitcoin because they made this video that jokingly said we accept Bitcoins. Well, there was a huge response to it. The, the label itself were, hmm, maybe we should do this. So they contacted BitPay, and uh, we, we were great. You know, we, we jumped at it to the degree where we were, I'd probably say, this close to getting on Saturday Night Live because they were playing Saturday Night Live right before the record came out and getting a QR code with the Bitcoin link. Well, the day before all this was supposed to happen, not the SNL part, but the other announced part, they, the band, of course, backed out because they were uncomfortable with answering questions about it in, in uh, media. Warner Brothers felt terrible about this because of how much effort we put into this, and uh, they maintained a, I maintained a great relationship with them throughout. And they, did, they would come back to help us out a lot, and this is another instance where they did. I just reached out to the guy that runs their Twitter, and they made the announcement that we're giving away money. And uh, usually when people say no one gives away money, it's a scam, right? It really wasn't, and uh, it was unique. And we knew that, and, and going in, my entire goal was to do as much as we could for free. We gave away $10,000. The $10,000 was provided by Change Tip, as they were the ones that wanted to get promotion out of this, and for them it was positive marketing. And the other, the other thing we did was, in addition to Warner Brothers, reached out to other guest tippers. So Shooter Jennings, someone that became, I became friends with because he's really into Bitcoin. Warner Brothers, as I said, Curtis Axel, a WWE wrestler, New Egg. Uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, who anyone that follows Bitcoin knows him as the Bitcoin guy, as he's been on Joe Rogan and, and a lot of other large podcasts. That's the one that's jumping out to me. Another one was John Fitch, the MMA fighter. Uh, they all gave people free money. And uh, the first one that we gave out was, I think, $200. And when you start off giving someone $200 over, over the Internet, you create a little bit of a buzz, and that was exactly what we wanted. So it worked, I have to say it did work out very well. Uh, the results... It's the most successful social media campaign in Bitcoin history, by far. Uh, the tripled engagement from the previous year's game, something ESPN weren't, wasn't expecting. And at the end of it, they, their social media team were like, well, how did this happen? We don't get this. We weren't even promoting this hashtag. Uh, and they, kind of, they came to me afterwards, and I explained to them. I said, well, here's why. We gave away money. <laughs> That's it. Really, it's really simple. Uh, what, what, I, what is important to know about anything, and any technology or product, project that you're marketing is your audience. Knowing your audience is important. The Bitcoin audience are heavy, heavy into Reddit. This is more of an informal poll. How many people here are Redditors? Okay. That's kind of what I expected. Um, not that, it, 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 in, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter unless you're marketing a product that their audience is on Reddit. Thankfully, this audience is heavily on Reddit. I knew that. Use that to our advantage. And as you can see, there were a lot of popular Reddit posts. Uh, that, maintain, that were on the front page of, I know they were on Our Bitcoin, Our College Football, and I think there were a few others, and it did really well. Uh, the estimated Twitter analytics are there, and we were the first uh, Bitcoin anything that trended on Twitter nationwide. Not, now, now, Twitter trends obviously don't mean business, all right? This is the essential thing I want to mention to you. This is a social media campaign. The goal of this was to get as much awareness as possible. If you read a lot of these publications and websites, they're going to just... Go over and over again the virtues of social media. Social media doesn't bring you money, all right? It's a communication tool. It should not be your only marketing method. It should not be your only marketing channel. But it is an amazing, it's an amazing, amazing tool to communicate with your customers. One that is really abused by a lot of companies and organizations. And by abused, I don't mean they send out dumb tweets. I mean they don't use it to its fullest extent, or they use it thinking that that means dollars or, or income. And it doesn't. It doesn't at all. And I, I always... Like to emphasize that over and over again, just because they think, oh, you're in tech, you must love social media. Yeah, it's great, but it doesn't mean that people are giving you money, and that's really a sense. In fact, in this, we gave people money, so it's the exact opposite. But all things, all things considered, it cost us nothing. We got a huge buzz about it. This was something that was very successful, probably my biggest success at BitPay, and uh, really, I learned a lot from it. I learned a lot in many different ways, especially the importance of relationship building. Um, Using music, right? I worked in music, I knew music, I loved it. So I, I knew what I, I used what I knew, and I reached out to people. Uh, you know, there was slow mu merchant acquisition. Our biggest competitor was Coinbase, an amazing company, by the way. And they were, re they were getting Dell as merchants. They were getting uh, Time Magazine. They were getting huge names. At the time, we weren't getting many. So I, did, I you know, went to what I knew, and I reached out to someone I knew at Web Entertainment. Uh, someone I hadn't sp spoken to in a long time just said, here, put feelers out. 
From there, it went to someone from 50 Cent's store, 50 Cent's e-store, contacting us about accepting Bitcoin. And this was about a week after his terrible first pitch he made last year that, that he threw out. And it was an awful pitch, and he was very adverse to doing media at the time because he didn't want to be asked about, this, about the pitch, uh, rightfully so. And we, we, we kept assuring his team that, trust me, this is going to be a bigger deal than you think. This is when Bitcoin is still hot in the news. If you're accepting it, you're going to get a lot of press. They didn't buy it. They were like, what's this coin? The garbage? No. He did an AMA. They announced it. It was pretty big. Uh, the same thing happened with the Sacramento Kings when they accepted it, the NBA team. Uh, they didn't think it was going to be a big deal. Actually, this even happened at Microsoft um, when we announced it, because they got out a little early, and they didn't expect it to be a big deal, but people figured it out and made a huge buzz about it. Not that we were complaining at all, but it, it has happened multiple times, so we would try to reassure these the, the people we're working with, and it, and it didn't work out. Uh, what happened with Warner is reiterated here. That, but what happened was we ended up working with Mastodon, uh, the metal band. They're actually based out of Atlanta, and they were ha very happy to work with us, and they loved everything about it. Um, they're very noticeable because the singer has a giant tattoo on his face, and they were kicked out of the Grandies, and they were the best dressed because one of them wore an L.A. Dodgers uh, complete uniform, and they looked awesome. They're really cool guys, actually, and we, we helped them out a lot, and they helped us a lot. Uh, helped us a lot. They got tons of press, and it all ended up working out really cool. As you can see, I got to, got to hang out with them during an event in Atlanta since they're from the area. Um, Another one is Shooter Jennings. Uh, he's really into technology, so he actually helped cut a commercial for BitPay that was pretty cool. He helped us out. He helped me out personally during Augur in a huge way that I'll explain in a minute. And basically, this gave us exposure in outlets that would never cover us. Uh, Rolling Stone, Spin Magazine, uh, USA Today even mentioned this. So again, these are things that didn't necessarily bring dollars, but at the time, our goal was to keep our name in the press because Coinbase was getting all of these giant wins, right? They were getting, they were getting Dell, right? Now, now business-wise, this isn't the same story, even close. We knew that. But what we did know is that in the media, it might even be bigger. So you, you get what you can. The other thing to do with the Bitcoin bowl that I had a lot to do with, actually, there were two things I was directly involved with, was the Bitcoin Bowl campaign and the first two commercials that were ever, the first two Bitcoin commercials to ever be on TV. Uh, both were during the Bitcoin Bowl, and uh, they, they were the first primetime commercials. What we did, though, as I like to mention, I'm notoriously affordable. I don't know a nice way to say how cheap I am with marketing. Um, so what we did was we hired a local firm. We didn't go all out. We, we were very conservative in how much we paid. Uh, very low cost. I think we paid less than $20,000 for each commercial film. Uh, Hired local actors, made sure I used local locations that didn't cost us anything. Everything was done on the cheap. And on December 26, 2014, they were the first two commercials of any Bitcoin technology or project or company to air. Uh, as you can see, we made Ad Age and you can see 790, 792 upvotes there on Reddit. So they were pretty successful. Um, it, this is something where it was one of those projects that was under my jurisdiction even though I don't necessarily know that it was something we'd do if there wasn't the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin Bowl sponsorship. Something that I, looking back on it, at the time and now, disagree with. But as it is, I learned a lot from it, so no complaints there. Uh, a presence on Reddit. Actually, excuse me, because I need to take a sip of something. I have a very dry mouth. Uh, much better. So, this is where you learn the number one... Uh, Misunderstood thing. And to say that, if I, say, if I give multiple number ones, that's probably because I am talking at OU for the first time, and I'm shocked there's just many of you here, so I don't know what I'm saying. I'm, no, but it's very important. is customer service. If you have a good job at customer service, you're going to get new customers. Everyone here probably hates Comcast. It's pretty obvious why. They suck. They're terrible. They're, they're miserable at what they do. They're miserable interacting with humans. They don't understand. And... and by this point, they should really have figured it out how to take care of customers. Customer service is essential. Something that market that every marketer could use is a year in retail. One year working in retail, and you will learn so much from how to treat people, from what people expect, and just general things that really are common sense that really carry over from the people who may have may have an MBA from Harvard but never had that experience. And this is something where that's a direct a direct example of that was being named one of the best, or I should say, best practices cases for interacting on Reddit. And the site managing communities used us as an example. We made it a point, if we were mentioned, to answer any problems in a public manner. That way, if someone's interested in using us, 
they see that we cared enough not only to respond, but, we, but that we did it in a public manner. So that's the kind of marketing that's essential. That's really way better than any sponsorship you can pay for. Because when people are interested in your service, that's what they're going to do is Google you and see what other people think. It's directly relevant and hugely important to anything that you may do, regardless of what industry you're in. The two other cases that I want to mention real quick from Reddit. Uh, the first one, unfortunately, happened a lot, of either both, whereas where I learned it on Reddit and, the, uh, and followed up via email was this company named Ship It To. They, and I was not a sales engineer, I wasn't a salesperson, I was outside of sales, outside of that sphere. Thankfully, I wasn't in a large corporation where I get yelled at. Instead, I was in a small, cool startup that this is encouraged. And basically, there was someone, their CEO was interested in accepting Bitcoin, signed up with Coinbase, I reached out, you know, I did no pressure, I'm not a, I want to come across as car salesman, and he even said, I can't really tell the difference between you two. I go, well, here, here's the truth. Just do me a favor, if you have a second, not cool, go on Reddit, look us both up on the Bitcoin subreddit. See what the responses are and the general feeling of, of the community is, and you'll see what the difference is. He did that. He replied, he said, I did that, and I just signed up with BitPay. Uh, you're, you're great in sales. How long have you been in sales? He actually said something like that. Your CEO should be proud, and gave me a bunch of other compliments. Um, and I said, oh, I'm not in sales. Uh, in fact, I, this is something I didn't even remember this whole thing. I, I vaguely remembered it until today, and I actually reached back out to him today because I wanted to, kind of, to just say, hey, that was cool, and I'm using it as an example. So it's an example of just how important all those things we did to maintain a positive, positive image on Reddit paid off. And they paid off in, in a customer that switched from our competitor to us. The second is more directly relevant, and I can just show you photos of. Everyone knows the unrest that happened in Ferguson last year. Well, while it happened, Ferguson Public Library was the only thing that stayed open. Um, as you'll see from, I think it's this tweet here, Tom Kaisar, P-M-R-A-R-C-A. Uh, how do you set that up? That's what he sent. Now, P. Marka is a, is a fairly well-known venture capitalist by the, uh, by the name of Mark Andreessen, from Andreessen Horowitz. They have funded all these large startups. They're also the primary funder of our competitor, Coinbase. So it, it was pretty funny that he asked them that, and I was able to basically go in there and scoop up the business while, while they did that, and their company was sleeping. And that's just what we did. It was at night. I was managing social media as a 24-hour gig, so that's what I did. And I said, we can follow you right now. I stepped in the shoes of a sales engineer and set them all up. And in three hours, we had them ready to go accepting Bitcoin to take advantage of it as soon as possible. I believe at the end of the day, they raised something like three dollars to $4,000 from Bitcoin donations. Not an amount that's going to save the library forever, but an, um, an amount that's, that they were definitely thankful to have. Uh, little things like that were how I stepped into a sales role. And I wasn't afraid to do it, because I knew the product. Knowing the product's essential. I knew the product enough to get them set up and going. Again, knowing the product. If you know it, you're able to do that. Some of you may end up in marketing positions where you're it's actively frowned on to do that. I would say that that sucks, and that's a company that probably will, in the long run, uh, have issues. I, I can't say they'll go out of business, but that's an attitude no company should have, because they, everyone should be interested in getting new, cu new customers. Um, I can't tell anyone what to think about large organizations, but I've tended to, tended to notice that the larger the organization gets, the more rigid they get with mindless and meaningless rules that really don't do anything but make hell for the employees. Um, just my perspective there, so take it for what it's worth. Um, a few other campaigns, and then I'm going to get off bid pay. Uh, partnering with major brands and accepting Bitcoin. ESPN, Microsoft, PayPal, Warner, Newegg. Uh, they're the biggies. Um, as you can see, they, they all were huge Reddit stories. The, the one I, I think was the biggest was Microsoft. When a company that large accepts Bitcoin and you're directly involved, it's pretty cool. And when you can use it to buy anything from Microsoft Word to Xbox, as well as, as, well as really what historically now at this point is, was their introduction of the technology, it is really pretty huge. And it ended up being a large story everywhere else. And I can't mention enough how interesting it has been, was to work with these companies because they're new to the technology, they were new to the community, and they all learned a lot from, from the community itself. I'm going to get off BitPay right here because it's really not, it's not hugely relevant, but I'm happy to answer any questions about any of the other cool stuff I did. Um, now I'm going to do Ethereum, and this is actually where, something where I wanted to grab, uh, something that actually was handed to by someone attending this event earlier. It was very cool. Now, now is where it gets fun. All right, Ethereum is jokingly what I like to refer to as Skynet from Terminator, because it essentially is. I'm not kidding. Uh, it's just very much at the early stages. And it allows smart contracts, computers around the world, that 
are part of a network that can run code. Essentially, that's what Skynet was in Terminator. So it is a joking term because it's not obviously going to take over humanity, but it is something that's really cutting edge to, to the degree that a lot of people don't know how to take it. It's known a lot as Bitcoin 2.0 or Blockchain 2.0 because it takes Bitcoin, which is financial transactions, to the next level. Something more useful, I, I would I, I think, and something that really changes so many different industries that the more you understand it, the more you realize the ramifications that it could happen because of it. Uh, also, it originally it was raised $18 million in a crowdfunding campaign. So if you saw the little ad where I, it said Augur raised, five, I think it was $5.2 million, and we were in the top 25, they were number four ever. Um, it was all started by a, a guy who was 19 at the time, now he's 20, his name is Vitalik Buterin, a very smart guy. He won the World Technology Award for Internet Technology last year in the Peter Thiel Fellowship. He's the, he was one of the founders of PayPal for people that basically are very young and start up their own companies. A very brilliant guy, really interesting project, and it's something that has really, in the past month or two, grown a lot and there's been a lot of interest in it, more than in Bitcoin, I would say. It's from the developer end, not from the media end or the, the consumer end, because it's a different technology with a different purpose. Uh, apps can be developed on top of it, and many, many, many are in development now. Uh, they have, a, they have a unique method of funding like Augur. We had a crowd sale for reputation tokens, which I'll go into a little bit in a second, but it's a new way of funding projects. And it's interesting because recently I had a conversation with uh, the gentleman that founded uh, uh, Angel, AngelList, the big, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the startup world, so they kind of have their own set of uh, terms and companies that are all, that everyone knows about, and AngelList are one of the biggies as far as getting attention from, from VCs and funders. And uh, he, was, he was someone who, who proposed a very similar model a year ago, one that Augur has done a very good job of, of, of enacting on. And um, uh, two individuals I met earlier are Terrence and Hopkins. They're right here. Uh, they were speaking to me earlier. And they're actually here in Detroit, and they're developing, uh, they're developing something on Ethereum. It's a blockchain explorer. So something that allows uh, individuals to see what transactions have occurred on a blockchain. And from what I understand, there's going to be additional features. What were, what were you saying the additional features were? Um, information about the entire ecosystem. So, uh, if you will, imagine like a Wired.com coverage of uh, the Ethereum blockchain ecosystem, which uh, I'm sure he's going to explain will be very vast. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and there is currently something similar on Bitcoin called uh, blockchain.info is the big one you get. Uh, I don't know, I think yours is probably aiming to be more comprehensive than that. Exactly. But yeah, this one gives you stats about the network because everything's transparent on, in Bitcoin. Every transaction is known and you can see. You can see how many wallets have been created, how, the growth, the number of users, all of this is publicly available knowledge and you need an explorer to see that. So the human eyes can see that and you don't need to go into very technical command line based uh, usage for so basically so a layman can use it and see what the balance is of a wallet and things like that. Now I, I realize I'm going a little too deep into this without maybe explaining more but I but that just came up and I wanted to bring it up while it was a relevant topic because then there's things happening here in Detroit. And I've had conversations in the past when it comes to Detroit with uh, an individual that now is heading MIT's uh, I think it's the MIT Media Blockchain Lab. Don't quote me on that. His name is Brian Ford. He was the former uh, one of the former tech advisors for the Obama administration in the White House. He's now heading up Bitcoin technology, working on Bitcoin technology at MIT. Um, and he's very, very interested in helping Detroit. It, he wrote an entire plan that was giving recommendations to the city of Detroit for technological improvements to improve a lot of the ways that permits are issued. And think that's a good example I use there. And uh, there's ways that this can help. The thing is, is no one knows if this is a year away or if this is five to ten years away, and that, that's the question that we all have. But it's the, there, there have been conversations that have had with very high-level people about this technology. So this isn't like BitTorrent, where the music industry just plugged their ears and pretended not to happen. The financial industry isn't that many. They've learned from their mistakes of others, and they're getting on this. And the same with governments and basically large organizations in general. The smarter ones are figuring this out and learning everything they can about it. Um, the two largest supporters right now are IBM and Microsoft. Microsoft made an announcement last week that they are partnering with, well, partnering is the way I can describe it without getting too technical with Ethereum, 
and offering Ethereum services on their cloud computing platform, Azure. Uh, basically, uh, for, banks can sign up and use their computing power for it, and they don't have to set up their own node, and uh, all kinds of complicated things. They're making it easier for people to use the technology. Microsoft's involvement is huge here, because Microsoft has really pulled a 180 in how they're viewed and how they're doing business, and for the better. And, and, and it's weird that in my lifetime that now I view Apple as the unhip and uncool tech company, and Microsoft is the cool one, because five years ago it was the exact opposite. Um, now back to, now I'm here to Augur. So Augur is what I'm, I've been working on and a project I've been a part of. It's an open source, decentralized prediction market. And give me a minute and I'll explain what that is, because there's an awesome two minute video we made that explains it all that I want to show everyone, because one, I'm very proud of it, two, it explains it in a really simple way and it's very technical. Um, it's the first major project on Ethereum that has had a crowd sale. So we set the tone, and setting the tone with $5.2 million is pretty awesome, especially when it's five of us and I was the only marketing guy on the team. Um, it was named one of the most exciting blockchain projects by, uh, by Coinbase, the company I mentioned earlier, who are the market leaders. And uh, we, we were also named a breakthrough technology finalist by CNBC and Singularity U. Singularity University is a, uh, I don't know if it was, I would say an organization or a website that highlights upcoming technology. Um, we're currently at working with IBM and the Watson project, the one, the computer that was on Jeopardy. So you're going to be able to actually ask Watson, much like Siri, about future events. And it's going to give you the most up-to-date, uh, the most up-to-date odds of that event happening. Whether it be, what are the odds Hillary Clinton is going to win the presidency, or what are the odds it's going to rain on this date? If there is a market about it, it will give you information. And that's, uh, that's slow and, impro and a while away, but it just kind of shows you that the big guys and the big players are something are interested in this tech. Uh, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done, by far. And in the video, you probably see why. And it's, it, even this presentation is challenging because it's a complicated idea in which a complicated technology is built on upon which a complicated project is built on. That's three layers that make this so complicated and hard to explain. The video that I'm going to show you took a lot of time to refine the script. It took a lot of time to explain to one of my best friends who actually uh, created the video about what exactly is going on here. And I, I can't emphasize enough how challenging it has been. But also, that's why I took the job, because it was challenging. And I find it pretty fun. Um, knowledge of a lot of different things are necessary. And that's really something in marketing that you're going to need on, on every level and every... It doesn't matter if you're selling a Little Debbie snack cake or if you're selling a baseball or if you're selling this. Uh, you need to know what you're selling, and you need to know your audience, and that, you can't get around that. S simplification is necessary, and uh, there's really nothing more than that, that that needs to be said. So the two-minute video I mentioned, uh, I reached out to a good friend, John Buttry, who's from the area here. I went to high school with him, actually. He's one of the best motion graphics designers in the world. Uh, and another friend, Shooter Jennings, that I mentioned earlier. He, he, he does host a show on uh, Sirius Radio. He's got that awesome radio voice that I definitely don't have. He was able to provide the narration, and he also had a studio that he could use, so he did it for free. And when I say that I'm a notoriously cheap marketer, this is the kind of thing I mean. Could have hired a voice artist, but I thought, okay, I know a shooter, let's see if he's interested. He was very interested. It took him a week or two to do it, but he did it. And as you can see by this last sentence, it's one of the things I'm most proud of in my entire career, because this really, this little two-minute video really was responsible for leading to a lot of auger success. So let's hope it actually works, because we all know how fun projectors can be. <laughs> And this is the only video I show, I swear, so I like to say that too. <laughs> and of course it doesn't. I hate to say that was expected, but it was, and it worked perfectly a few minutes ago. So I'm only going to fiddle with this for a second, and then I'm going to move on, if not, which is unfortunate. Try the knob by the computer. This one? Because earlier was the other one that was necessary, but you may be right. markets allow users to purchase and sell shares in the outcome of an event. The current market price of a share is an estimate. 
of the probability of an event actually occurring. The prices of each share adds up to one dollar, so if you buy a share at even odds, it will cost you 50 cents. If you end up being right, you'll receive a dollar for that share. These markets rely on a scientific principle known as the wisdom of the crowd, which states that if you ask enough people something, their average answer is usually far more accurate than any expert. This allows us to create one of the most powerful forecasting tools. The problem with previous prediction markets is that they were centralized, allowing them to be easily shut down. Another problem is that with any prediction market, someone has to report what actually happened after the event occurred. In centralized markets, one person does this, which means there can be mistakes or outright manipulation. With Augur, we'll have thousands of users reporting on these outcomes using something called reputation. Using Augur, anyone, anywhere in the world can create a market asking a question about anything. Market makers provide some initial funding for the market and in return receive some trading fees. Anybody can freely buy and sell shares in the outcome of that market. And the current share prices provide the best estimate of that event occurring. Imagine being able to Google questions about things that haven't happened yet and receiving accurate odds of your occurrence. That power, the power to glimpse into the future, is what we believe everyone should have access to. So that was the video that we used for a lot of our marketing. It was used as an introduction to the technology. It was used as an introduction to basically everything we do. And it, it serves a very good purpose on multiple levels. Getting developers to contribute, this is an open source project, to entering it into different competitions, to promoting the crowd sale. That was really what, why it was created, the central piece of that. Um, it was used as a part of our submission in, this, in CNBC and Singularity to use Exponential Finance Conference. Um, it was pretty funny because we sent the video and we, we, we haven't released it yet. We just sent them, you know, you know, a very early, not an early cut, but basically a week before we publicly released it on our YouTube. They, within the next day, the next day, next morning, I was actually driving back to Detroit. They called and said, we've already accepted you and we think you're going to make it to the finals already. So we just wanted to let you know that we've actually taken you out of the FinTech uh, category, put you into the breakthrough technology category because that's really where you deserve to be at. Uh, you, you just not aren't really suited for the fintech startups that are involved. You're way uh, ahead of them, which was cool, uh, especially because the, that conference, the exponential finance conference, is the most I, I consider it to be the most influential and important fintech conference in, in the world. It cost four thousand dollars a ticket, and it ended up selling out two weeks in advance. So a lot of these fintech con conferences and just find a way to scam your way in by getting a free code, this people were that excited to get into. We had interest from a lot of these major financial, uh, finan legacy financial companies and organizations, and I can't say enough about how that also cost us zero besides lodging and trans, and we were able to get all kinds of exposure that ended up really being instrumental to the success of everything we did after. So that video helped us out in that way alone. Uh, it has 190,000 views since it launched in May 20th. Uh, it's the most viewed prediction market video in history of YouTube. And this is an idea that's been around for a while. The second most viewed video is us as well, but the third most viewed video is a market called Intrade that was uh, around a, a few years ago, and they had 10,000 hits. So it shows you the level we were able to get. Um, simplifying that is, is necessary, and it really was something that we wanted to target the crowd sale. We wanted to make sure people involved in the crowd sale knew what we were doing, knew that we were taking this as a professional, that we're professionals, and that basically here, here's how we ex are explaining it to the world so that we knew what we were doing. They may already know a lot about pr uh, prediction markets. We, we don't know that. But what we do know is they may not know a lot about Augur, which is positive. So let's give them everything they need to know in two minutes, no longer. Um, it had multiple front page Reddit posts, hundreds of upvotes and comments, and again, I consider it to be one of the best things I've done in my professional career. Uh, among others as well. Uh, market leader Coinbase named us as the top five uh, companies uh, in the blockchain space. Uh, these other projects, I just, just to put us into perspective, we had, I think, before we launched, I, th we, I would say we had about $200,000 in funding. A lot more than a lot of projects, but a lot less than many. To put it into perspective, 21 is the second one. You can't really tell by their logo. 
They have 120 million in funding from Samsung, uh, Qualcomm, I believe, and and Reason Horowitz, a lot of these other big heavyweights. So to be named in that category, I think Blockstream has 20 to 30 million. So our project with five people and $200,000, most of which was going toward development, was able to be listed in that same category. So to me, that was a personal thrill because of who we were targeting. And it ended up you know, giving us more credibility, which is really what we were hungry for to promote the crowd sale. Uh, it was able to get mainstream media coverage and all these outlets. I was interviewed in Fox News. No big surprise, they misquoted me, but that happens. Uh, and um, and we, we got all kinds of great press. You know, A lot of it was that we raised more in three days than Oculus Rift raised, I believe, altogether. Um, and that was a very high profile project. So it, it was great to speak to some of these outlets. Some were hostile, some were friendly, some were interesting, some, and some we, we never heard back from. Um, TechCrunch we were mentioned in, but it was in passing. We had a very hard time getting anyone interested. And it turns out it's because they're actually very friendly with something that's competitive to Ethereum. Uh, and, and so they weren't interested in covering many Ethereum projects at the time. There were other outlets like 538.com from Nate Silver. And Nate Silver is the one that's responsible for, I would say, the, 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 the idea of Augur and from a piece that he did in 2012. And they, they wouldn't cover us. So th there was a many that we reached out to that wouldn't for, for various reasons. But what we got, we, we fought for and we scrapped for and we were very happy to get. Um, what's next? October 1st was the final day of the crowd sale and it was also the next phase of Augur. It was my role being reduced. As, as I mentioned before, in, in, my, in speaking in London, my role switched to basically part-time because we, during the development process, marketing really isn't needed other than developer outreach. Which is why I'm not taking out other projects. I'm teaching a course in Bitcoin at the end of the week. I'm still the director of marketing at Augur, and I'm still doing Mar Augur work, and I'm still going to be involved, but right now, I'm really not needed that much, so having me on board would be really inefficient. So I'm very happy to take a step back and say, okay, let, let's see what else I can work on for now, because I do have a vested interest in Augur. So if I have a vested interest in Augur, I want to make sure that they have the best shot possible at succeeding, which means managing your money right. Marketers should know how to read a balance sheet essential. If you can read a balance sheet, you know what's, what's responsible spending and what's irresponsible spending. Um, the team members have changed drastically, and things have changed drastically overall. Uh, the beta release we're aiming for is December 25th. Uh, it's tech. I, I never like to promise any dates because things change drastically. When we promoted our crowd sale, originally our promotion just said summer of, 2000, of 2015 because we didn't know. And uh, th that's something that I'm very insistent on saying. If it's tech, and you're promising a date, you're probably going to be in trouble. Give a rough estimate, ensure that you reiterate that it's a rough estimate, and people will have less high expectations, which is a good thing. It's better to over-deliver than to over-promise. So what's next for Ethereum? Uh, their DevCon conference that I was invited to speak at last week was just huge and full of huge announcements, tons of different projects being announced on it in so many different ways. And uh, the partnership with Consensus to, to provide blockchain as a service, as I mentioned before. It also, the, the most notable thing was a presentation, a keynote presentation by Nick Zabo. This is the guy that everyone thinks is Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin. He's the one that uh, everyone wants to figure out this mystery, right? No one knows, and no one knows it's Zabo, for the record. People have a very good idea, and there's a lot of breadcrumbs that lead people back to being Nick Zabo. And I think this is the most interesting thing to happen probably since D.B. Cooper, as far as mysteries. If you're not familiar with that, look it up. It's very interesting. And uh, everyone wants to know who he is, and I love mysteries. So uh, the keynote really got a lot of eyeballs on this. And it's all up for, uh, for everyone to check out if you want to Google it. Just shoot me an email. I have my card up here. I'll be happy to send you a link to the video. It was his first public appearance and public presentation. Um, his project Bitgold really started out a lot of this Bitcoin thought back in 1998. So this is stuff that people were working on for decades. The other one that people really think uh, maybe uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was John Nash from A Beautiful Mind, because he had a uh, he had a few different papers about ideal money that really are trace that trace the uh, the origins of what Bitcoin is. There's many issues with that, but there is something to the guy that was basically going on lectures around the world about a technology that's pretty much Bitcoin for decades. So no one knows, I don't know, but it's interesting. And these are and either way, these people are both brilliant. And, I, and they both have uh, Princeton ties, I believe. So it's interesting to look at. And those are the kind of people that are interested in Ethereum. Well, not John Nash, because he's passed away, but Nick Szabo. 
Um, it's only released in phase one, Frontier, which is very technical. So uh, unless someone in here is a computer science major or very interested in command line, uh, him, uh, yeah, you're probably not going to be able to directly use much of many Ethereum services right now. Um, and I would recommend not using them unless you are. Uh, and that just launched in August. This is a very long-term project. As you can see, it's still going to be for advanced users very long, long, long time. Uh, that's kind of the scope of a project this large. It takes years to complete. Um, Skynet wasn't built in a day, I guess. Um, there has been some notable tweets about Augur. Uh, we have everyone from my friend Shooter Jennings to Brian Armstrong, the CEO of uh, Coinbase. Max Kaiser, who hosts a show on RT about economics, politics, and different topics. Vitalik Buterin is the uh, creator of Ethereum, uh, as mentioned there. And, and just my favorite tweet is, actually, I think I might have skipped one, did I? No. Say no more, Google it, say Augur it. That's probably my favorite tweet we've ever received, because I hope someday that this, that's what happens. That's one of the side goals of the project. Here's a, a couple media quotes that are awesome. Uh, Raising more Oculus Rift in three days of crowdfunding. Vapor no more, Ethereum is launched. And there's a little piece about Augur on there. Um, in smart contracts, the algorithmic markets would save us from another financial crisis from VentureBeat. And uh, another one about raising 1.3 million in 26 hours. We're almost at the end, and I'm going. This is I, I, I purposefully made this like this so I can answer questions because I hope there's plenty. But um, what I did was, as of October 1st, now I'm an independent contractor consultant. So that's what I'm doing. And there, these are a few of the projects that I'm either loosely affiliated with, interested in, or working with. Um, a lot of the blockchain startups lack marketing. What they do is they have a, it's a developer maybe creating an awesome project, but what they don't have marketing. They don't know anyone who can market something. So they hire a cousin. Well, he knows how to market something. Odds are he doesn't know how to market something like this. It's not easy. It's not easy for me, and it's definitely not easy for anyone that's new coming into this because it does require expertise in the whole crypto space as well as expertise in whichever industry the app is developed on. And that usually is something I have to learn as it goes along. I'm speaking to someone right now about this, uh, uh, an insurance type project for pensions. Um, I know nothing about that, so I have to learn about that. And that's an entirely new industry I need to learn about in, oh, about a week. And it's not easy, and I'm not claiming to know everything, and nor is it possible, but that, that's hard. And that's something that a lot of marketing consultants aren't prepared to do. And that's where I come in, and I'm willing to do that. Um, I'm, I'm, there's been an increasing demand since October 1st, and, I, there's, and people have kind of discovered that there's more demand and that, you know, that I'm going to be available as well as Augur's success. They've been contacting me. Uh, some big names that I can't share to some startups from with two developers that are just really interesting. I've yet to make up my mind on what I'm working with next, as originally November was supposed to be my month off, which it clearly hasn't been. But after I take an awesome trip next week to uh, Puerto Rico, which is completely a vacation, um, I'm going to decide, hopefully, what to do next. Um, and uh, some of the other things that I've been involved with are collaborating with Singularity University's Mike Halsell on a blockchain technology report, and that's for the UK Prime Minister, David Cameron. It has not been published yet. You not have the publication date, but I'll be named, I'll be credited, and that will be out soon. Uh, I've prepared materials for DAP, which I'm going to go into a little bit in a second, because I created a special, a couple special slides for that, because that's a cool project that at least the ones raising your hand as Redditors will be a little interested in. Uh, I've advised a few large VC firms on projects that are coming up, saying, hey, this is worthwhile, you're going to get a bigger look, or you should probably stay away from this, one of their guys is crazy. Uh, and I'm teaching an introduction of Bitcoin, Bitcoin class provided by Atlanta's largest accredited tech professional development organization. So that, that's actually at the end of this week, and I've been preparing for that while also preparing for this. Here's DAT. DAT stands for Decentralized all, th all the Things. It's the decentralized Reddit. So basically Reddit where there's no one server, but servers from around the world running on a, on a giant computer. Uh, the, it's had all kinds of press already, especially a few months ago with, the, with all the controversy from Ellen Powell leaving. Uh, the, the founder, a friend of mine who I worked with at BitPay named Ryan Charles, Ryan X. Charles, uh, he, he basically went to, posted a Medium post and he got such a positive response from the wire, from Wired, from Engadget, that he quit his job and started this up. So that's really what he's been working on full time and I've been helping him out. Uh, the business model is taking a portion of payments between users rather than from advertisements. And uh, it really is a different model, and it's something where Reddit relies on VC funding. Uh, this would not need to rely on VC funding. Uh, it dis disrupts, decentralizes journalism. This is, the big, this is what really got me interested in. 
Incentivizing, incentivizing journalism is something that I think is extremely important because it's really, other than corporate media outlets, who funds the journalism? Who funds the hard-hitting, you know, is everyone here familiar with Charlie Leduff? So most people, right? Charlie Leduff is a very unique phenomenon to Detroit. The same with the roof to the rescue. That, those kind of, that kind of stuff doesn't exist in the news of most, most cities in the, in the U.S., right? And I don't consider that deep, deep digging, but that, even that level of depth does not exist in most cities' news. So you realize how essential journalism is to getting the truth out, and then you realize there's something wrong when journalists now are having to go to BuzzFeed and they're getting paid for clicks instead of quality of content, right? So, and there are people that want quality content. It's, not, it's, it's very true. And a lot of them are business leaders. Business leaders willing to pay. So let's make it there, there be a way so the business leaders can pay for it, and really it can be exposed to the world. It's, it's a cool idea. It's far from being over, but that was really the, the kicker that I kind of thought of. Like, hey, this solves that problem. That's a big problem. It's a, it's a way bigger problem than I'm even stating here. Something I've thought about quite a bit. And it also ensures free speech. It eliminates censorship and moderator abuse. So moderators that can you know, just really take over a subreddit, like what's happening to the Bitcoin subreddit. It's not controlled by one man. In fact, I am banned on it. If you talk about me on our Bitcoin, banned. Which I think is kind of cool in one way. But in another way, it sucks because I wasn't able to promote Irish crowd sale on there. And that's the big community where, where they're coming from. But in another way, that also means it's even, even surprises me more how successful we were considering we talk about it as banned. And I didn't even know my name was banned on there until about a week ago. Again, I'm more proud about it than, than not because of the reputation and the space that, that that Reddit had, that subreddit has right now. But um, and I wouldn't recommend anyone go on there right now because everything you see is so heavily moderated that you're you're not getting the full story. In fact, you're getting very a very small sliver of it. And uh, you'll never hear about me on there again, apparently, unless I change my name. Um, and with that said, you can check out more at dat.co, uh, at that dat network, and you can contribute at the GitHub page. Again, these are all available, just ask me. Uh, we really, we need contributors right now. Um, these are all open source projects, so they really rely on the community to, to review and update and make sure that the code is correct, that the code is honest, because it's up to people. This is run by people. This is personal empowerment that's done through open source technology. This has nothing to do with trusting someone like Apple or Facebook or Twitter or whoever else with your information. This all it has to do with getting your information back, getting platforms back that you can say things on that maybe the government or a business doesn't want you to say. You need to make sure that those are protected, but you also want to make sure that there's safeguards in there to prevent abuse happening from happening. And those are things that really are being built in and thought of by a lot of the people that are creating these platforms. So it's a tough, it's a tough thing that you need to way, but that's why the community is so essential for these open source projects. The other one is one that's been, that I've been on hi hiatus from, but will be coming back, and it's my podcast. It's called Decentralize. Um, I've had a really big variety of guests, weird, weird guests. Steve Albini, he produced Nirvana's In Utero, uh, Foo Fighters, The Pixies, he was one of the guests. I called him up, or I actually didn't call, I called him up for the podcast, but I sent him an email. He called me, the, 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 the filthiest word I think I could say to it, but everyone in this crowd, multiple times in the email, the first response, and starts to see. And I thought it was funny, but I replied and said, hey, my feelings are hurt. Here's why. And, and he says, oh, I apologize. I'll do it. He ends up being like the nicest guy in the world who, who basically has become a friend and uh, just giving me great advice. He still hates finance, but he's produced some of the, some of the most important records of the past 20 years. And uh, my podcast with him is my favorite. Others have actually said other shows are better, but I had Glenn Jacobs, who's a WWE wrestler, talking about economics and uh, things you've never, de decentralized technology things you wouldn't suspect. Shooters on there, Andreas, Robin Hansen, who's an advisor for Augur, and a brilliant guy who works for NASA and DARPA on a, a government-sponsored prediction market in the past. And Jeff Garzik, who's a Bitcoin core developer, now working on Dun Vegan Space Systems. So what he's doing is launching a lot of micro-satellites around the Earth to back up the Bitcoin blockchain. So even if the blockchain on Earth doesn't work, and all these computers go down, you're going to be able to use your money because it's going to be in space. I think that's really cool. So, I, and that's the kind of thing that things that really this technology is enabling, and the kind of projects that are being in development, and things we talk to. One of the other cool things was Open Bazaar was something that we uh, we featured, and it ended up getting VC funding uh, six months after we featured them. So it's really cool to say that you know you're a part of that early part of that. And they're basically an Etsy, but decentralized. So instead of Etsy taking whatever cut they take, or eBay taking whatever cut they take, they take one percent, which is pretty moderate. 
And, and these are the kind of things that are going to end up being the technologies that replace what's there now because it's going to cost cut and make it cheaper for individuals to create their own businesses and their own startups. And that is pretty much it. Here is all my contact info, and um, I'm hoping there's going to be some questions. So that's what I'm leaving the rest because that's usually where the best conversations happen.